solve. Today we will go into a slightly different way of calculating stuff using the GPUs. So um, later you will see more in Amdex that there will be hybrid usage of CPU and CPU. So this is a uh, module that has been developed by uh, our team at IIT Hyderabad. Shorab who is currently in Penn State, Tushar who is currently in Germany in Dusseldorf. And they have all been behind this module. They have been, uh, Tushar's thesis has been one of the important things that have uh, led to this module finally. And Shodhav has worked hard on it. And recently, Pushkar and Achyut have been working a lot. Uh, and uh, due to their awesome work, actually, uh, yesterday night, we could make the Docker image uh, working. And so people can use directly the Docker image. They can load the Docker image. Uh, in Param machines also, once the Docker image uh, the usage is allowed, you can use that directly and load the image. And then you can run this GPU machine. The idea on the GPU machines, remember, this is CUDA. So CUDA is an architecture which is uh, proprietary of NVIDIA. So this will work only with NVIDIA GPUs, starting from K40. So, so currently, the backward compatibility is such that K80 onwards it works. Uh, K80, P100, V100, H, uh, A100, H100. All of these uh, will work. However, K40, there is a problem. K40 does not work. K80, although it works, some of the some of the CUDA or MPI stuff may show some conflict. Okay, please understand. But one thing I'll tell you, recently what NVIDIA has done is equivalent to Tesla K80 and all, or equivalent to Tesla V100, they have come up with this uh, new cards. For example, my laptop has one of such one such card, some R the uh, R series or something. I, I can go tell you the exact specification if you want, which you can buy on your laptops. And by the way, those who have uh, GTX cards, many of these, some of these support only floating point. So only thing that you have to do is you have to go to the source code that I will show you and you have to change the position or make the, uh, put a flag that the position is only floating point. It's not double position. So double position is eight points. And, uh, uh, and and uh, single precision is like uh, four bytes, so the accuracy will reduce. But you can still run. By the way, you can still run on your uh, GTX using your GTX card. Only thing it becomes very very slow. The double precision calculations become extremely slow. How many of you have some GeForce cards or something for gaming? Just look at your speakers. On your yeah, screen. if you have GeForce cards, so great. So those who actually play games can also run. Uh, these uh, codes. In fact, in the Xbox, uh, by the way, all this GPU coding started uh, in Japan, and Japanese are uh, very famous for their gaming. And uh, historically, the idea was that they took out all the GPUs from the Xbox and they uh, put them together on a board, and they started using it for computation. And they found that it works awesome. So, we, uh, and it has very different ways of handling memory, and it has also very fast. Uh, uh, speed. So as a result, the speed means uh, the, the it's a frequency of accessing all these things. Means basically by each alone is much much weaker. Means each processor alone or each core alone in the GPU is much weaker than the CPU core. However, when it seems you can do it collectively, and I'll show you how it is done. It is something like a so there are this. It's like a it is a multiprocessor by itself. So which has a lot of cores with a very little amount of memory in each core. So I will show you in detail. So I will show you how um, uh, we are developing, what we have developed so far. And one thing we will do in the afternoon when I may not be there uh, go for an uh, urgent meeting tomorrow. But uh, my students, uh, Chut and Pushkar, they will show you demonstrations. They will also give you account access so that you can right you are going to give account access yeah so they are going to give you access to accounts in isc as well as in iit hyderabad you will you can temporarily log in but for we cannot give it for more than a day right now um, and you can log in and you can use the docker image and you can run some of the codes that we will show some of the the, the test cases that we will show so our our module uses multi-phase 
multi component kim kim suzuki formulation so uh, abhix is a grand potential formulation ours is a kks formulation so in general it's a same multi phase multi component formulation only thing he uses grand potentials uh, on the other hand what we do is equality of equation potentials at the interfaces okay and then we solve the phase field uh, equation and for each each phase we have a phase field and um, and within the phase the phase field is homogeneous that's something very important and then it varies uh, uh, the 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 you know diffuse way not a sharp way and the diffuseness is what um, the uh, is something that you can specify in this type of models remembering that noting that what you do is you impose the equality of diffusion potentials at the interface between the phases any two phases there will be equality of diffusion potentials and then you have also the diffusion equation that you solve uh, together or diffusion equation or kanhler equation but you generally solve that diffusion equation and other than that one important thing that we were going to demonstrate here is that you can also incorporate different multi physics so in one multi physics is basically elastic stress effects during precipitation so when the precipitates um, in solid state when precipitates form like for example one of the one very common example for all material scientists is aluminum alloys where you form this uh, 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 this copper precipitates alu aluminum uh, l 3 cu l 2 cu precipitates you know the sequence initially it is like a copper precipitates so these are like copper clusters very small copper clusters that are gp zones and then you get this l 3 cu which is coherent it is a completely coherent <laughs> coherent means lattice planes and directions are continuous and then you go to l 2 cu where you have some planes uh, some facets that are coherent some facets that are incoherent as you know incoherent interfaces have higher interfacial energy when the coherent ones are low because coherent ones on the only thing that happens is a uh, a stretching of bonds but you and you have unlike bonds but you do not have dangled bonds unlike an incoherent in coherent case bonds are basically dangled and there there is a lot of dislocations and stuff and as a result you get a very high energy at those interfaces on the other hand In the, in the coherent interface, uh, you generally get very low interfacial energy. By the way, coherent interface is one of the ways that all these different things, like for example, including you know uh, this uh, the Boeing in Boeing aircraft, for example, the body is made of dual aluminium. Dual aluminium is aluminium copper alloy, and aluminium copper alloy derived its strength from that precipitates. And the precipitates also why there are two things. One is the precipitates had a different. They are they are ordered, right? They are ordered, and how do I distinguish order? We can distinguish by using a phase field. The phase field is different, so phase field distinguishes different ordered variants, right? That is possible, right? And second thing is the coherence strength, and the coherence strength comes as a result of lattice mismatch. There can also be there can also be other effects, secondary effects, like you know, like elastic modulus mismatch and stuff. But remember, this is something in aircraft. It's not just People think of aircraft engines when we talk about precipitation, but think of the aircraft body. Dual aluminium is one of the alloys that was used because you have to have light weight, but you have to have high strength. It was one of the alloys that was used in uh, aerospace industry for a long time. And apart from them, uh, there is nickel-based super alloys that are there. By the way, precipitation skills also derive their strength from ordering as well as from coherence. So that is one of the things that I have to tell. Another thing. Since the interface energy is low, you will see some phenomenon called coarsening does not happen as much as when the precipitates are incoherent. Okay, so any enough of metallurgy? Again, I come back to this. So basically, currently with this uh, means metallurgy itself is very interesting here. So one thing, this module can simulate precipitation and uh, solidification and uh, and it uses NVIDIA GPUs. So please understand. Uh, Funny's group uh, developed in OpenCL. OpenCL does not care about GPUs. It can be NVIDIA, it can be AMD, but currently our uh, module uh, uses uh, CUDA and NVIDIA GPUs. But NVIDIA is also very much actively pursuing these GPUs uh, and making them faster and faster. Right? They are they are they are developing very fine technologies like semiconductor technologies. By the way. Many of these codes that you have seen from the first day onwards can all be integrated, and as you know, semiconductors coming very big way in India, and many of these codes, by the way, can be used. For example, whether you are doing single crystal growth 
for semiconductors, whether you are doing some semiconductor laser annealing, whether you are looking at electromigration, thermomigration, all of these cases, phase field models is the model to go because phase field models use a diffuse description of the interface. You do not have to explicitly track the interface, and it becomes very, very, very comfortable using phase field model when you come to uh, complex morphological features like dendrites and stuff. Okay, uh, you cannot use, you can use sharp interface model, but you have to track the interface because very, very difficult and awesomely difficult numerical. So, but in the phase field case, it's very natural because you are using a diffuse description. You are having free energies as a function of P, grad, P and so on. So as a result, it becomes very easy. You don't really require to. So it's a level set approach, which is so simple that you don't have to uh, set any contour or anything. So it just naturally, you can, uh, look at very complex interfaces. That is one. Thing. Second thing, uh, so here we are using something called CUDA. So you have to have an NVIDIA CUDA toolkit installed. If you have gaming computers like, uh, you know, like the Dell, uh, uh, what is that? Alienware. Dell Alien, Alienware. Anyone who has a gaming computer, even if it is Windows, we can make it work. And if you can, count, uh, and now with the Docker image, thanks to Pushkar and Achyut, I feel that if you have any gaming computer also, we can make this module work on that. <coughs> the Alienware is one, HP has also some, uh, I know. So now the another thing, here we do, so here we'll give an example, although we are testing it out, we are, there are more things to develop. What we have done is it's not just GPUs, but it is GPUs and communication across multiple GPUs. So it's a multi-processor, in some sense, it's a multi-processor, multi-GPU board. So it can use multiple GPUs if these are on board or they are across boards. Like you have one desktop here, another desktop here. This desktop has one GPU card. The other desktop has another GPU card. You can basically combine these two desktops and you can with a T-cable. So basically something like a T-cable or a three-band switch. You can just use a switch and then you can also run these boards. Okay, so this is something very, very interesting. So, by the way, if you remember, there was one model that won this uh, famous uh, this, uh, prize. Uh, Gordon. Huh? Gordon, yeah. yeah. So, that prize uh, went to first to a phase field group uh, who used Subame computers, where they had lots of GPUs and they also communicated the GPUs through MPM. And they did a massive certification simulation. Okay, Gordon Bell Prize, they won. So, one thing you have to understand, actually that code may not be as fast now. So that time it became so tremendous because it was scalable, it was huge and this is the first time they are using so many GPUs together and they could show how GPUs can be used for doing such computations. Uh, very complex PDs like in Facebook. So communication between GPUs happen, between, happen using MPI. MPI is something that you have already learned, right? In the, you have already learned in uh, grand potential solvers and all. So in the only thing here is called a CUDA aware MPI or basically these are called GPU direct connections. That means it is also called RDMA technology. RDMA is remote direct memory access. Remain, remote direct memory access means you do not really communicate through the waste. Waste does not know from one device to other device how the memory is getting transferred. How data is getting transferred it directly happens from one GPU to another GPU without the OS or the CPUs knowing. So it is a GPU direct technology which we are going to use here. In fact, our solver now uses that. Only thing is that GPU direct technology requires some upgradation in Param and stuff. And that is something that we are working on in the Param machines, the NSM machines, um, to make it readily accessible. It works with multiple GPUs. Our codes now presently works with multiple GPUs on the board. But across the board, when it comes, it works on a big cluster. It works on my cluster, but it has some problem with the LSM cluster. So that is one thing. So another thing, uh, you have already used singularity images. So ours, since the Docker is the first success, we will also create singularity image and we'll use soon. Maybe uh, within the mid of it, we will be able to get it, right? So, uh, assuming that, but Docker image itself will be uploaded, okay, uh, 
uh, in our uh, GitHub repository, we'll upload this Docker image or link to the Docker image. So that is one. Second thing, CUFT in, uh, MP enables rapid elastic calculations. We are actually, by the way, the elastic calculations that we'll do, we use a approximation. All the phases that we incorporate, all phases have the same modulus, same elastic model. However, we are also working uh, on uh, this uh, inhomogeneous elastic solver, which is multi GPU. And this will soon be released up, I think, up in the end, end of March. We will try to, huh? July, 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 sorry, sorry, yeah, July. Yeah, not the end of March, because then uh, he will also rush me. <laughs> so we'll test and we will uh, uh, keep that. There, you see, as soon as that module also comes, the number of problems that you can do increases many. Already, you can do elastic interactions, precipitation, and all. There, you can do thin film breakup. You can do a lot of other stuff. Um, you can look at applied stresses and strains and stuff. Okay, so that is one. Second thing, paraview visualization through HD55 and VTK is now enabled in our uh, micro sim. You have to understand one thing. I will not use paraview, but I will use the micro sim post processing tool here. Huh? When I will show the demo, micro sim post processing tool. I think on 26th of Jan. There is a special session on how to use the post processing tool with all its capabilities. Actually, it's a, I think Tanmay developed this tool. Uh, Tanmay and uh, huh? Ajay, ah, Ajay, Ajay, Ajay developed this. Ajay initially developed this tool. It's a very awesome tool. It has lots of features, even uh, it competes with Paraview in that way. Actually, and it's also very fast. It's really, really fast. In fact, it is faster. I, we have seen in 2D at least, we have seen it is faster than Paraview even. In many cases, so that's a very nice tool that has been developed. Post processing is something that is very important because after we do simulations, what do we do with that data? Right? We require a lot of information from it. So that is the thing. Now this is one example. Uh, I think Abhig has also shown this example. Oops. Now this simulation should run. That's my only. Goal. Yeah. Really. So the simulations run. So this is a, a precipitates in a ternary alloy, which are coarsening. You can see they grow. After that, growth has stopped. And what is happening is larger precipitates grow at the expense of smaller ones. The smaller ones dissolve. So this happens due to Gibbs Thomson effect. Gibbs Thomson effect happens due to curvature, right? Because due to curvature, there will be capillarity effect, and also due to elasticity. Okay. So there is also elastic Gibbs Thomson. Both Gibbs Thomson will basically lead to this that the smaller ones will have higher concentration than the larger ones. And as a result, there will be a concentration gradient. And as a result of that diffusion, the smaller precipitates will dissolve and the larger ones will dissolve. And you get this bias new cuboidal shape. Why? There can be two ways. One is interfacial energy anisotropy. But interfacial energy anisotropy is very much important or it influences the shape at small sizes, very small sizes. As you grow in size, Elastic energy slowly takes over, and elastic anisotropy gives rise to these cuboidal shapes, as well as these orientations. As you can see, these are these are called elastically soft orientations. Elastically soft means elastic energy along these directions, like one zero zero and zero one zero directions, are is lower than along one 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 direction. We will come to one demo, uh, one test case where we'll show both ways. Okay, so this is one. And this is uh, dendritic growth in aluminum zinc alloy. So, as you can see here, so this is uh, during solidification. In a, this is in a super cool liquid. Uh, and then you can do lots of nice stuff. We did the 3D things here, and we could do the elasticity 3D there. So, we in fact, we could see how the plates, as, as you can see, initially these are cuboids. Now, as you go farther and farther, they become plates. As you can see, they are becoming plates. And plates are something that are favored by elastic energy. Elastic energy becomes dominant as the precipitates grow because elastic energy goes by volume, as you know. Interfacial energy goes by area. So the smaller sizes, interfacial energy is what drives everything. On the other hand, at larger sizes, this is the elastic energy that dominates. Yeah? And that is something that we always play with in metallurgy or materials science. That is something that 
interplay of elastic and intermission energy and again their anisotropy and stuff is what we basically make use of to make materials with better properties okay so whether it is a better electrical property whether it is a better mechanical property we basically look at we play with this factors so i just briefly briefly again this is the this must be a repetition this is something that has been already explained in the gp models so i'll just tell you so as you know you have this multi component multi component means you have to basically uh, if you have multiple components then you have to specify concentration for each component so you have concentration field for each component remember we are describing phase field model so you are describing fields fields are point functions unlike say, unlike unlike extensive parameters these are intensive parameters intensive parameters thermodynamically intensive parameters that means they are point functions they can be described as point like temperature field temperature can be described as point pressure can be described as point density also volume cannot be you cannot describe volume at a point right if it is not specific volume if it is one specific or a ratio then maybe uh, then you can but unless otherwise these are all intensive parameters remember these are thermodynamically intensive parameters and c is an intensive parameter similarly we use this mathematical function phi okay which basically this distinguishes between different phases okay so the phi has some value like value of 1 in one phase the same phi will have a value of 0 in all other phases and the phi varies smoothly across the intervals that's the idea okay and that variation basically gives you two quantities one is intermission energy another is intermission width and another thing we do is across all these interfaces we ensure equality of diffusion potential between the phases so this is basically some the, the same thing the diffuse interval version of the stefan problem so anyway so once we have done that we have now described a configuration see so think of this we are describing a configuration where there are phases and each phase has some this field and some composition property right some some p values there can be multiple phases and there can be also multiple compositions now once you have done that um, uh, and then you define the elastic properties and then you also specify the interpetial energies between the phases what you have now the total free energy of the configuration minimizing that free energy is what will basically give you the final structure isn't it so that how the structure will evolve structure will evolve in such a way that the total energy is minimized not one of the energies remember it is possible in that case in such a case it is highly possible interpetial energy say increases but at the same time you will see there is a decrease in the overall energy or and that happens because bulk free energy as well as say elastic energy is also change, uh, reducing this of increase remember total energy is for minimization is what gives the microstructure not individually each energy is not decreasing okay total energy is what is so this is something again you know this is the allen kahn equation uh, that we do for the these are the total non conserved phase field variables and diffusion equation again as you know so one thing i have to tell you when you do diffusion equation one very important thing you have to understand is there is this mobility matrix or the diffusivity inter diffusion is what you calculate inter diffusion is what you calculate experimentally from the composition profiles and that is what that is the data that is there in all databases but what you generally do is once you know the inter diffusion coefficients then you also and also you know the thermodynamic factors thermodynamic factors are nothing but the curvatures of the free energy surfaces of each phase del 2f del c i del c g okay so these are these if you know that or del mu del c so once you know that then basically you can calculate m and then you can plug in here and you can solve this equation we can solve this in fourier space or you can solve it in finite difference finite volume methods we do not use finite element as of now we use finite volume and finite difference and fourier here in, in in our model we have used finite difference the elasticity is only calculated in fourier space i'll come to elasticity part because that is one part maybe that is not discussed as of yet or maybe it is discussed in a small amount i'll discuss a little bit more if time permits so one thing you have to understand in kk's model what you do is we use something called phase concentration these are some fixed variables which are the concentration of each species in each phase and we have to remember there is this interpolation function we use hp 
we use this function but there are also other functions like 3 square 3 minus 2 pi and all so we use this functions mass conservation means the total concentration of the element that you give across all phases should sum up to that same right the mass cannot increase or decrease that is one thing and then are also the equality of phase chemical potentials is something that has to happen across all phases so a chemical potential of every component in a given phase must be and then you have all this now you have to connect them right you have to connect all these different free energies you have like individually if you look at the free energy composition you have like free energy and other free energy of alpha phase beta phase like l and l3 c if you think of it. so uh, how do you connect them you can connect using uh, we use something called a multi well potential but uh, abhi uses is multi obstacle potential both of them have their merits and demerits it's not that you, it depends on the choice that you make uh, whether you use a multi well or a multi obstacle potential now comes one thing that i work on in general in my research uh that is the uh, so i generally work on the uh, i come from the uh, say for example unlike fani and abik i come from the, the solid to solid transformations uh, community uh, for them they come from solidification community they have emerged from sir more into solid from solidification they come to solid state from solid state we are going to understand solidification so ultimately uh, inside this field also there are this subdivision so we look at elastic stress effect elastic stress effects arise when you have coherent surfaces if you have coherent surfaces you it can also arise if you have modulus in homogeneity but one of the major first order effects is if you have coherent surfaces then these interfaces uh, what does it mean it means the lattice planes are and directions are continuous across these interfaces however the lattice parameters of the phases are different if the lattice parameters of the phases are different what you will get is something called lattice parameter mismatch lattice parameter mismatch gets translated into something called mystic strain or eigen strain or stress free transformation strain i will give you one diagram of shelby problem this is a very very classical problem this has been studied by uh, shelby the shelby wrote some 60 70 papers that's all but all of these papers are like classics so so if possible read shelby it's uh, uh, it's very means we still try to understand actually it's very difficult and very condensed but very beautiful so so uh, to understand this and remember this is the problem that we are doing for precipitation you can also apply the same idea if you are looking at composites if you you can apply the same idea if you are looking at say for example uh, 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 thin films you are looking at say polycrystals elastic stress effects in polycrystals they are also you can use the same viscoplastic self constant theories based on hlb problem hlb problem is something so universal it is everywhere in whether you in any field of mechanics you go you look at that scale where you have this you can distinguish between the phases or you can distinguish between different materials and you want to understand how the stresses again remember when i am talking about stresses and strains these are fields stress is a field Field means it's again a point function. So six components of stress or six components of strain, you can apply, you can get at each point. And stresses and strains are related to displacement field, right? Something called displacement field. Remember, there is something I don't know how many of you come from solid mechanics background. In solid mechanics, uh, one thing that you study first, elastic is the elasticity equation, right? And that is equation is statistically Hooke's law. You use something called sigma equals to c epsilon, right? So that is something that we use. Only thing, sigma equals to c epsilon. Sigma c. This is actually a misnomer. This is elastic stress. Stress is stress. Stress does not have elastic or plastic, right? So it's a stress effect. But elastic strain. Elastic strain is a function of total strain as well as the eigen strain or the mystic strain. And that is, by the way, and this is something that we are doing for precipitation. You go to multi-ferroic systems. I think a big might have talked about any system. Go to semiconductor thin films where you have these epitaxially grown films. Everywhere strain becomes very very important in solid state. And strain is not a harmful thing. Strain is a thing that you can use to tune properties. See, ultimately, if all these things do not give you useful correlations between process 
structure and properties you will not be attending or sitting here you will all go because ultimately the goal is to get design materials with best properties and these gives you a way to design materials with best properties just sitting on your with your desktop and some workstations without doing lot of experiments okay without doing a mindless number of not uh, mindless huge number of trial and error experiments please understand each super alloy development took some 20 to 30 years what gamma titanium aluminate for aerospace application came after i think 40 years or so the first paper came and after that people told it is a useless material and then it came back after 30 years and now you cannot live without gamma titanium aluminate so it's, it's it's almost like that so please understand this is something that we want to avoid when we learn phase field modeling phase field modeling in the in some ways will give you a way to do design at a much much accelerated pace today you want a new material in one year time you want to get to the first prototype you cannot use another 20 years for the new material to come so that is how phase field will help you okay so this is how so this is one thing that i have to tell you this you know half sigma into epsilon right half sigma into epsilon is elastic strain energy all of you know okay beautiful and sigma is what stress and epsilon is strain so that's it you know everything so now if you see this epsilon so this is something that i i feel uh, so i just show it here see here i have given this thing. uh so i just want to yeah so this is a elastic as you can see so elastic strain is something that is you know elastic strain means within the elastic limit so that means you stretch a material you remove the stress it comes back to its original position that is the elastic strain elastic strain as you can see is this minus this this is your eigen strain or the strain that comes in that front of the and this is your total strain and then you see now what i'm doing is it's of sigma i am writing c and c is nothing but a modulus and c times epsilon elastic is what we do see right but if see total strain minus eigen strain is your elastic strain huh? and remember the in homogeneous elasticity you develop then what you tell your elastic stiffness also can be potential dependent Okay, the elastic stiffness also can be position dependent. However, currently we are assuming elastic elastic modulus only C zero, right? We are assuming elastic modulus is only C zero. That C prime R is absent currently in our model. Or even if you give different elastic moduli, we take the average elastic modulus and use it. Okay, that's all I want to tell. I can strain field. One thing that I have to tell. This is something already included in our model. Like multivariate microstructures, that one example will give. You will see that each variant can have eigen strains which are non dilatational. In general, we think of eigen strains or strain that this parameter is meant to be dilatational, but it is not true. Say, for example, you have cubic to tetragonal transformation. Now, cubic to tetragonal, tetragonal has multiple variants, and each of these variants, not in all directions, C along the say, C axis, the strain is more. Along the A plane, the strain is very, very less. So you can have tetragonality. Okay, this is called tetragonality. Okay, so I'll go there. Yeah, this one and this one. So as you can see, we have written this in a very simple form. Epsilon star is the magnitude of the misfit parameter. Okay, and then you have one TM1 and TM2. TM1 and TM2 are the ratios of this epsilon two star by epsilon one star, epsilon three star by epsilon one star. When all of them become one, then this is nothing but a dilatational. Dilatational can be compressive or tensile. It's like I have a sphere, it becomes a bigger sphere. I have a sphere, I have a, say I have a sphere which is alpha and I have a sphere which is beta. Now this alpha and beta have different lattice parameters. I am telling beta is like a slightly bigger sphere than alpha. That is called isotropic or dilatational identity. Or beta is a smaller sphere than alpha. Okay, so that is the right. But you can have cubic to tetragonal, you can have hexagonal to orthorhombic, you can have this type of, when it comes to this, your strain can be anisotropic, which we can handle. Strain anisotropy you can handle, anisotropy in elastic modulus you can handle. Right now, only thing that we do not handle, which will be included by July, is the elastic modulus mismatch. Otherwise, all of the stuff we are able to.
Now, this is the crux of the problem. This is where, this is actually this, I, this is a good picture from Khachaturian, but this is actually not Khachaturian's problem. This is HLV's problem. Khachaturian solved it, and we use that Khachaturian's theory to solve it. That's why I have taken this thing. The problem is called HLV problem. That's why I wrote in plain terms. Okay. So the idea is very simple. You take, it's, a, it's called a Gedanken or a thought experiment. The thought experiment that HLV had. Okay, so so the experiment was very easy. You take, take take a material and then you punch out some holes. That means you take out some material, then allow it to transform. Now, once it transforms, it can now become anything, right? Well, you have allowed it to transform. It can become an ellipse. It can become whatever it wants to. It can become a needle or whatever. Now you have created a hole. Now you have to put fit it into the hole. How do you fit it? It has expanded. So if you see, you go from here to here. You have you have now these guys have now changed, right? This this whole material, these materials have transformed here. Now these guys have to be fitting. We have to fit it to the hole. This is the genesis of eigenstrain. So how do you fit it to the hole? You have to give a surface traction to fit it to the hole. Now once you give a surface traction, then so you have to give that traction, and then only so you are giving that traction here. And once you have given the traction, you have fitted the hole. But now there is some surface stress, right? Now you release that stress. Now what you get, what shape you get is the shape of the coherent misfitting particle. Coherent means the lattice parameters are stressed in different ways, but lattice parameters are not broken. Not a single lattice, not a single bond is broken. Only the bonds are wrong bonds. That's all. They are wrong bonds. Okay. Say, for example, you have AA bonds inside the material and BB bonds outside the material. Means, uh, say, for example, look at, look at this one. You have AA bonds inside, BB bonds outside. At the interface, what bonds you have? AB bonds. AB bonds are the wrong bonds. That's why the energy is high. But see, these energy, these bonds are not broken. That means no defect is there. So that means the energy is still quite low. Please understand, in, that is one of the reasons why we use superalloys like nickel versus superalloys, where the Misfit strain is also low, even the interpretation energy also, that's why is very, very low. It can be as low as 10, 20, 12, 12 millijoules per meter square. Okay, that is one of the reasons why, because if they coarsen and become very big, they lose strength. You have, all of you have learned something called precipitation hardening, isn't it? In precipitation hardening, what you have learned, if you have very large precipitates, incoherent precipitates, dislocations can easily bypass by using something called R1 bypass. But, what is it? Or what? Ha. So one thing we do, although uh, the GP solvers do not do it, GP solvers solve velocity in real space. Okay, using some varlet velocity varlet type of algorithm. Okay, which is like uh, in molecular dynamics also they solve it in real space. But you can also solve the Khachaturian hard GP show is that there is something, some technique called a Green's function technique. I will not go deep into that. But only thing I have to tell you here, this is the equation that we want to solve. Please understand divergence of stress is nothing but force. And sum of forces equal to zero is the standard mechanical equilibrium equation, right? Sum of forces, in a, in a, if a body is in mechanical equilibrium, the sum of forces on that body has to be equal to zero. Sum of forces equal to zero comes out to be the divergence of stress field. Divergence of stress field, now stress is nothing but C times strain. Now strain is nothing but strain is related to displacement. How? How is strain related to displacement? If I write x r and i j, then strain is equal to half strain u by del x j plus del u j. Now see, one important property of epsilon ij is that it is symmetric. Epsilon ij equals to epsilon j i. I will tell you one very interesting thing that there is also, which we not uh, currently refer because we are not dealing with plasticity. So we have also this half del u del x j minus del u j del x i, and that's called speed or rotation del u j del x i. That's called. Right? So this is something that we do not care about. 
we will understand any any is the matrix right is the matrix is a so for example it's a matrix a matrix can be written as half of a plus a transpose plus half of a minus a transpose no? right that's what we are doing and remember this is called derivative let's say is called deformation Right? Is called right? So now this is the strain. What we do? If you think of this, if I have to solve, this is only thing that I wanted to tell you. In solid mechanics, if you want to solve this, what you solve? You express sigma in terms of C as <laughs> and then you can solve. But along with that, if you want to make solutions, you have to use something called compatibility condition. That cannot be a whole. Right in the system. So you have like huge number of compatibility conditions. But if you don't care about that, you can basically use this definition and convert this into a problem that dot sigma equal to zero can be then written as if c is constant. So c is constant c that dot epsilon total minus epsilon zero equal to zero. Now, now, if I do this way, C I D T L, this is constant. Now, this constant means it's not vision if I do. If that is so, then this can be then epsilon total K L K L. So this will be if this then epsilon K L, then this will be what is this? You understand in this initial operation? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I can do it to the quantities. Do it to the extreme. So, that I have done goes equal to minus k. No, they are not equal to the plus and the value. Okay, sigma 1 1. Equals to okay. The way I, I can do it is this. Way. Mm. Uh, how do I write this? Uh, okay, I'll do this. See, you know this uh, hooks law, right? So that sigma i j equals to c i j k f epsilon k. Do you know this? You don't know. You know this sigma equal to c into epsilon. This you know. This you know. Ah. So, if you know this, now uh, what is epsilon? What is the definition of epsilon? Change of fantastic. So, if I want to write that in terms of say displacement or deformation, how do I write deformation, right? Changing length by origin length. How do I write that in a different form? Okay, C times? Longer, longer. Here, here. Here, okay. Then, what is this here? What is the here? Okay, it is yeah, you are telling this is like delta L is it? C times delta L by Okay, and what is sigma? Sigma is force by area. Is that okay? So now you tell me this is force by area, this is C, C is some constant. What is this constant? So this constant is some k times delta l. Right? So this is nothing but k equal to k times delta x. Huh? K times uh, but I don't want to do that. I tell you why. Okay. Uh, what is force? And what is the difference between force and stress? Okay. Okay. Then force is a force. Force is a vector and this is a tensor. Very good. How does it happen? How is this force is a vector and this is a tensor? How do you do it? How do you represent an area? If you can tell that, then you are done. How do you represent any area of position? 
by using a normal to the end. Correct? So, can I write if I take a volume? Now I will go to this. What can I do? This is called a control valve. Say I have taken this control valve. You have to understand there are two types of forces. One force is like force of gravity, and that happens to the center of mass of the body. Okay, that's called a body force. And then there is also another force that comes due to surfaces, right? Now, if that is so, if this is your x-axis, this is your y-axis, and this is your z-axis. Now, if I want to write force on this surface, what are the components? How will you write that force? The force can be this way. Force can be this way also. And force can be this way also. So, how, so let us write this way. Sigma Z Z. Okay, or sigma B B. You can write. Here you can write. This is this component is along y. But it's on the on the same plane, all right? Because same plane, why do you call it same plane? Because it is perpendicular to the z axis, right? Now, so this will be sigma. It is called y z or z one. Y z, huh? Or z one. You just figure, okay? Draw, draw, draw. And then this one will be sigma x. So here, let us look at this one. So there will be one thing. This is basically. Along this, so this is sigma x. Similarly, you will have sigma. So you know what? If you have a force that is parallel to the surface, what is that called? Shear force. And then you have also normal force, right? And these you are basically when you write sigma, why are you writing sigma? Because you are taking this area, and you are having a force. Force by area, as you know, is stress. And we are calculating something called a stress scale. You do that. What do you get? This are these forces sigma x x, sigma x y, sigma x z, sigma sigma y y, sigma y x, sigma y, and then sigma. I cannot take a full elastic class. Then I have to know how to do the angular and angular momentum. Then I have to physically tell why it is symmetric and all. If I do that, then this entire class means I have to teach till uh, uh, the end of day. That is not <laughs> something that I intend to do. But yeah, so you know this, right? So if you know this, only thing that if you know this, you have to understand this way that because of this angular momentum, because the body cannot rotate by itself, right? Because of some of you know, right? The moments you basically take up, take up point. You calculate moment. What is moment? Moment is force times distance. And once you do that, what you will get is that sigma x y equals to sigma y x, sigma uh, y z equals to sigma z y, and sigma uh, x z equals to sigma uh, sigma. Yes. Now, once you have done that, you get basically. Now, think of this. I will make it very simple. I will make it super simple. I will tell there is something called a stress vector sigma x, sigma y. So, I will write this way. Let us do this very quickly. So, we call it 1 is basically x, let's say 2 is basically y, and say 3 is. Now I write sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2, sigma 3 3. See, these are diagonal, right? These are diagonal. And then you have, I, if you want to know how am I writing this, you just think of the normal. So remember, area is written by normal. Think, think of what is the normal to this area? 0 0 1. 0 0 1 is the normal direction. There you go. If I look at z axis, if I look at, at an area perpendicular to the z axis, what is the projection of z axis? 0, 0, 1. No, very good. This is 1, 0, 0. Okay? And this is 0, 1, 0. Right? Now, this will be the series of very quickly sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3, 
See, I have written an apartment limit, right? Because sigma is smart to one is nothing but sigma one. And sigma 2, 3, 3, 2 is nothing but sigma 2. And this is also sigma 1, right? 3, 1 is nothing but. Now you see, I use a very interesting notation. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now you see, I have six independent components in this matrix. Okay, so this is the best way to look at the stresses. So you have six independent components. And then similarly, for strings, it will not be different. Strings, strings also you can write the same few things. So then basically you have six independent components. You're trying to See, yeah, I am not going to see by the way, the definition that we told, no, changing length by original length. There are two ways of defining it. One is looking at the original area, another is looking at the deformed instantaneous area, like true strain engineering strain. So I am not going to do that, I am not going to do that, but I tell you, see, this one, four, this one, five, this one, six. Okay, now my new matrix has become. Tell me, if I have to write a relation between sigma and sigma, I have a, this is a so 6 rows, 6 by 1, oh good, and this is 1 by 6, 6 rows, 1 by 1, so what will this be? You will have 36 elastic constants, and these will be basically CE11, CE12, CE13, then up to C16, similarly you have, now these are the elastic, again you will see, that because the energy is a scalar, remember, energy is a scalar, strain energy is a scalar, energy is scalar, right? So as a result, sigma dot epsilon is a scalar, as a result from 36, you will get 21. Why 21? You have the 6 and then 15, 21 elastic constants. Now, if you do something called symmetry, have you learned, you have learned symmetry, right? If you think, which has higher symmetry, which shape has higher symmetry? Ah. We are exactly beautiful. It has infinite symmetry. Beautiful. That's called isotropic system. In an isotropic system, if you do this rotation, no, it's very good that you can actually went to Q. Q is the next one. So the <laughs> highest one is the highest one is Q. Right? So you have two elastic constants in the C1 or C1 2. In case of movie, you have three. In tetragonal, so you can actually do that. How do you do that? You please read nine. I cannot do the entire space in the city here. But one thing I tell you, this is where if you are saying that you use the Laplace equation, actually that's what we solve. It's like the Laplace equation is not what we solve. Only thing that I want to tell is in solving mechanics, when you solve sum of forces equal to zero or vector sigma equal to zero, actually what you are talking, you know there, this is called sigma not n. Force is fraction of force is nothing but Fn equal to sigma dot n. Okay. Now think of that. This there is something called divergence theorem all through, right? Cause divergence theorem. The dot n basically becomes black, right? Divergence. So divergence black. Dot n is for the surface. If I take a surface integral and take it to a column integral, it becomes black dot, right? And once you do this black dot sigma equal to zero, what you are solving is this. Sum of forces equal to zero. Over time, you have an integral. Now, not an integral, it's a differential. That dot sigma equal to zero. Now, once you use this letter sigma equal to zero, only thing I am doing is I am taking this very quickly. I will tell you sigma 1 1 equal to say, can you just write, can you at least tell me for one component, if I have to write for this sigma 1, let us write it this way. Tell me how sigma 1 is related to. Epsilon 1 to epsilon 6. Can anyone tell me? It is equal to C11 epsilon 1 plus C12 epsilon 2 plus C13 epsilon 3 and so on and so forth. Now, epsilon is again related to displacements. How are they related to displacements? Can anyone tell me very quickly what is this displacement? You have a body, and you have a potato, you have somewhere here. How do you define this here? You define this by using the some modification. And then you put something called R. Then you go somewhere, you take the deformed body, 
and call it arthritis. And then this guy is called displacement. You have heard of this? Have you seen this diagram? Okay. Now, as you told that delta u by delta, delta u by delta u by l now becomes what? Del u by del u by del position, na? Del the position, right? So with this, with respect to position, right? So so x y z are in position. U is basically change in position. X plus delta x minus x. X y plus delta y minus y. So this remember, so this becomes del u by del x. For example, now think of this. Now you understand. Epsilon now del. Epsilon one is del u del x or half del u del x plus del u del x. Correct or not? So this becomes right. So it is nothing but del u del x. Think of this now. You have sigma. If you look at epsilon one, you have del u del x. If you look at epsilon two, you have del u del y. If you look at epsilon three, you have del u del z. Now these are basically what are these called? Principal. Oh my God, you are going very high. We go a little less high. So what are these called? These are tensile or compressive strains. Right? These are not shear strains. When you go to shear strains, you have both. I right? tell you because you remember you used to make a change in angle. You have this, then you will like this, right? You do this, right? So you have a change in angle. So what does this mean? You have del u del x as well as del u or del u del y and del z. Remember, sigma is related to all of this. All the sigma components are related to all of this. But we are doing something is that part sigma. That part sigma is by right in terms of displacement. Then strain is first derivative of displacement with respect to position. Now you have a drag dot. Drag dot by definition is if you do only it is drag dot is what. Derivative again in the first derivative. The first derivative dotted with the first derivative gives you del to del x square. So basically, remember, it ultimately goes down to like you are solving equations like del to u one del x square equal to zero. This is the equation that you solve. Del to u one del x square equal to zero. Del to u two del x square equal to zero. Or you can also solve del to u one del x del y. Now see all these equations. Once you have, what you do, you know, you have written strain in terms of displacement. Your compatibility conditions are already satisfied. Now, what you are solving? What is this equation called? You have seen an electric field with any area equation. If the Poisson's equation is equal to E equal to what? Del to P del x square equal to rho by x r z. Right? Now, remember, let us assume there is no free charge. Then this becomes zero. What is this equation called? Laplace yeah, equation. You come back to a Laplace kind of equation. And how do you solve Laplace equation? Infinite difference or anything? How? How do you solve a Laplace equation? Forget finite difference. Analytically. Analytically, what Green's function? Del two u del x square equal to zero. How do you solve it? Exactly. You take integration twice. Twice, right? First integration gives you one integration constant. Second one gives you another integration constant. Then you put the boundary conditions, and then you basically get k1 and k2. This is exactly what we are going to do. However, there is one interesting challenge. Please understand, this is where a shall be problem and everything, and this periodic boundary conditions become important. Think of this. What we generally take. When we do phase field modeling, I do not take the entire plane and solve it. It's not like macro body. We are looking at a microstructure and we are solving things. This microstructure is called a like control volume. You, you know the control volume concept, right? All of you. So, so what will it be in this case? It is called a representative volume. This representative volume represents the whole body. You can also call it statistical volume. You take this and assume that this is repeated all over space. If it is repeated all over space. Have you all of you are from metallurgy? No, some are from mechanical and all. But you have done some basic materials. 
what is very important characteristic of crystalline materials what is the difference between crystalline materials what, what order no not all crystalline materials are order rain mountain is it becomes polycrystalline material but what is important for crystals ha ah, what is it these structures are made of what lattice oh, lattice plus motif is the crystal structure and what is the unique property of lattice crystal it is periodic it is it repeats infinitely in space it is infinite okay but we can now call it we can use something called a periodic boundary condition now what is naturally comes out whenever we tell something called periodic what comes to your mind when we tell something is periodic huh? you know if i tell mathematically something is periodic what immediately comes to your mind ah what comes to your mind when you tell something is periodic sine wave cos wave and when you have sine waves and cosines what comes to your mind next fourier series what we basically do is we approximate everything using fourier so as a result what we are solving here please understand i am not going to the detail of it in fact maybe i will use some recorded lectures to give you where you can understand the detail of it what we basically do is that we are assuming the displacements to be periodic remember many of the boundary conditions that a week also imposes i also impose because we are looking at microstructures are periodic boundary conditions that means we are telling our represent this representation say for example this table i take one small representation and i tell this is repeating periodically if it repeats periodically i can represent this using a sum of sine and cos waves if i can represent them using a sine of sum of sine and cos waves then basically what we can do and what we generally do in material science is like x ray diffraction when you do that where do you go you go to from real space to reciprocal space what is the property of reciprocal space that's also periodic but what you have now is k instead of x and k is related to x in what way how is inversely related baba it relates inversely to something called lambda a wavelength a characteristic wavelength right and in this case what is that wavelength or periodicity that comes from in the crystal structure case it comes from the lattice parameter in this case in microstructure case it's not such thing we are telling we are taking a large enough chunk and we are telling that it is repeating that means this here the, the wavelength or characteristic wavelength is the length of the domain itself now once we do that what we are telling is displacement is periodic once displacement is periodic what we can use is called an integral transform technique called fourier transform technique because any function any function which is periodic can be represented by a sum of sine and cos waves okay yeah. once we have done all of this okay i don't want to go into the detail of this but one thing we will do oh thank you thank you one thing we will do so uh, actually the, i think uh, i thought many of you are from mechanics but anyway what we will do is if you want to understand more please understand since it is periodic we use something called fourier transforms in our solver however you can also use real space methods like finite difference methods but you have to impose periodicity by the way anyone quickly can tell me when we tell a boundary condition is periodic like right? you know neumann boundary condition right what is neumann you specify the flux what is dirichlet you specify the quantity itself what is periodic i'll just drink this what is periodic <laughs> what is you, you have seen pvc pvc exactly so how do you do that what does that mean is it like you fix the quantity or you fix the flux or the derivative see neumann condition means you fix derivative right dirichlet condition means you fix the quantity itself and then periodic boundary condition means you fix what you only told no what comes in goes out or something like that what does that mean 
Fox is constant. <laughs> no? Think, think, think. Mm -hmm. sine wave me. What is the what is periodic in sine wave? Think, no, no. After a wavelength, what happens? The function repeats itself. Sine 2 pi plus x equals to sine x. 2 pi is the period. Exactly that's what he does or I do. If you look at our codes. You remember the picture I gave you? The translation. Ah, so it is repeated means what? The value here again repeats after the period. So think of PVC as translation. Yeah. Okay, Neumann is reflecting. Ah. Okay, to reflect properly mathematically, it's just in the periodic computer is in translation. So translation means wavelengthness. Ah, and translation means this quantity here, again you translate to some wavelength, that same, that periodic wavelength, again it comes back. And as a result, the derivative as well as all this, the equality of derivative means up across that wavelength, whatever quantity is coming, again that quantity appears. Correct or not? That's what is translational periodicity means that only now. You are translating it. Again, you are translating. It's the same. How does it become same? So that is called translational periodicity. Please note this huh? displacement boundary conditions are periodic. You will become a bit otherwise confused. Don't get confused. See, you don't have to know the math behind, but you have to understand the concept behind. Then you can only apply the GY properly. Huh? So concept, when we tell periodic, remember translation huh? as a big just now told you very nicely. And when you apply Newman, re remember reflection. These are very, very simple things that you have to remember. Huh? Dirichlet, I think you don't have to remember anything. But these two you have to remember because in your system, what you will use depends on the physics that you want to put in. And the physics is coming from whether you can use periodic or not. Say, think of this. You have a thermal gradient. Can you put periodic boundary conditions? Can you? No, no? Okay, good. So that is, these are things that you have to understand. So where you can put periodic boundary conditions, where you cannot. Huh? So here we are putting periodic boundary conditions and that is the use of Fourier transform. And that's why you use something called a spectral method. Okay, I will go to detail of it. I cannot spend so much time because I want to demonstrate stuff. Only thing I want to understand, this is a very important thing. If you have electric energy, then there is something called, if you have something called electric energy, how, how do you define electric energy between two charges? Okay, elastic energy, you know. Okay, now I'll tell you. Energy, you know, right? Chemical energy also we have discussed. Then there is something that we derive from that in phase field model. That variational derivative of free energy with respect to order parameters. What is that? That's called? You have done that, now nah? you have written an F, then you did something called del F, del P or something like that. What does that mean? What is this? Why did we do this? Uh, where is that? Ha, ah, this one. What is that? Del F, del P. Okay, forget del F, del P. How do I say this? Are you, if you have energy, you want to do energy minimization, how do you do that? What do you, what? Chemical potential, exactly. So this is exactly I'm telling like chemical potential. You can also look at something called elastic driving force. Elastic driving force is basically, what does it mean? Elastic driving force is nothing but, I'll tell you what is elastic driving force. You just think about it. It is nothing but stress. Stress itself is the elastic driving force. Okay, and that is what we calculate at each point. And based on that, the material flows, okay, the matter flows based on that changes happen, transformations happen, okay. And this is something already incorporated in our solver. I do understand we have a beautiful GUI. I do understand we have beautiful post processing tools. But you have to understand one thing. We want you to be very informed users. You should know what you are doing because you use micro -sim, You use boundary conditions which are not relevant. Then it will become a big problem for you as well as for us, yeah. You should not do that. You should... In fact, if possible, if at all required, if you are doing problems which are very critical, you at least ask us whether the boundary conditions that you are using make sense or not. Okay, we can at least help you. 
any of us but you should do that yeah you should not blind use okay you, you are told periodic i will put periodic don't do that huh? so that is something that i am uh, telling you see you you don't have to understand the nitty gritties of the solver right now as long as you are not developing okay but if you are using you have to know all the physics of the problem that you are solving huh? please for example homogeneous modulus approximation may not be correct for some cases for the most of the cases like precipitation it is fine and it's actually a very good approximation because what you want to see is the how the precipitate shape changes with size in general what happens in general you will see for isotropic intervention energy a precipitate appears as a spherical or circular nucleus then it grows and as it grows it changes shape and that is shape change with size is something that is a very very inherent property in solid to solid phase transformations and that shape change in size gives you these different properties the unique properties the mechanical properties like good grip strength good fatigue strength all this comes from the please understand microstructure is the central part which controls the relation between processing and property if you understand microstructure you understand property and all of us are here when we look at materials we look at materials properties right we want best properties because that properties will give you the best components like the best mobile phone isn't it the best battery for the best mobile phone so that is what you have to understand or a best flight uh, where you know things will remain forever as it is uh, for say some 100 years you want such materials that is why we are all here right so that is the thing please understand all this is controlled by the microstructure and that once you know microstructure actually you know property by the way all properties most properties not all most properties are microstructure dependent okay my microstructure is the key to property huh? so you have to understand now one thing this thing you have already seen there is in micro sim can anyone tell me in micro sim what you basically do there is a in file generator after that what do you do you choose a model or in the in file generator itself you choose a model why do you choose different models you have choice that's how you choose is it why that there are so many models huh Uh, super model okay each model has its own capabilities but please understand right now all models have very similar capabilities in terms of functionality however each model has its unique way of solving stuff each model has its unique way please understand all these mathematical formulations should converge for a given problem that is one of the ways to check that the problem that you are doing if the physics is correct all models should converge to the same solution this is something that you should please understand this way also this tool is a very unique tool you don't see such tool i don't think my class or anyone has implemented this here you have several models to try out and you can see that all models converge to the same solution this is a very very important thing if it does not then there is some problem see you are using the same boundary conditions you are using everything same physics is same how will different models behave differently you will see approximately they come to very very close same solution in fact if you have looked at the documentation properly or you should look at the documentation properly to see that we have done such benchmarks okay so please have a look at that i think all of these you know remember depending on the portability and stuff also you use solvers for example if you have a access to a big cluster you use uh, cpu cluster you use uh, a big uh, gp solver however if you have some uh, cluster with some gpus you may try out the gpu solvers that we have like myself or funny okay so all the solvers you try out also based on what you have resource you have but remember still always try to run your problem with two or three different solvers and see whether they basically converge to very similar solution okay otherwise it's a very dangerous thing okay you will think that this solver will solve better than this solver that means physics is coming differently for this solver this solver is better no this is not so because inherently the physics that you put in it comes to your boundary conditions initial conditions and the model and the model is basically very very similar 
for our case. So please do this whenever you do solvification or precipitation or any such complex problem. Remember to use one or two solvers, okay, and to see that whether they convert. Yeah. So <clears throat> now in multi GPU, okay, if you want to know about this software, so one thing I have to tell you: please understand the idea of this, this GPUs is this that you have, say, for example, the simulation area, and in the simulation, so this is multi GPU. So yeah. So remember the way. The implementation in GPUs happen. The single GPU happens is that there are blocks, and then in each block is composed of a lot of threads, and each thread is nothing but a processor. You can think of a very small processor which does some which can do some calculations with a very little amount of memory. Now, when you do multi GPU or MPI, you have seen this ghost cell thing, right? I think already a big has explained. But anyway, you you look at that. Only thing that you have to understand is. It is enabled. The GPU's communication is enabled by CUDA or MPI, which is using our RTMA technology. I don't want to go into the detail of RTMA, but you have to understand this way. Graphically, you understand it directly goes from one GPU to the other. That's all, without using this host and stuff. You can do this also using some other way. You can also go from GPU to CPU, CPU to CPU, CPU to GPU. It's a long process, but in our code, it goes directly from one GPU to the other. And that's how all this. So basically, you have a big simulation size. It is distributed. It is basically you, we are we are using a slab type decomposition here. And the slab type decomposition, we are basically transferring all of them. We don't use pencil type decomposition yet. We use slab type decomposition, and we put it across many GPUs. And all these GPUs do the work on those slabs. And then there is this ghost cells or buffers also we use so that you know uh, there is some overlap. Uh, so that you know. Uh, no miscommunication means there should not be any miscommunication such that you suddenly get one discontinuity if the, uh, when you join them back. So, can anybody tell why is communication required at all? Why do you need to communicate? You have distributed the task between different workers. Why do you need to communicate? This is not like task means we are not doing tasks independently. Yeah, this is domain decomposition. And these things you have to be very careful where you want to use the parallelization and how does it work. So that's why we use buffer layers. I think these things you please use it. And if you have questions, you ask us. I think we have a forum now, so we can basically answer. So uh, you please ask us. Huh? Why we are how? Yes. And we'll keep posting answers. Yes. And the whole branch will be able to 
Yeah, we will mediate. But you will start a program like this, it will be user mediate for somebody. Yes. It's very important that we do that. So these things I am the performance and scaling, we don't want to go. Only thing now, now, now that I will install, one thing I'll tell you. You have done Docker images anytime? No, you have used Singularity. We will do the Singularity image soon. But Docker image will basically give you a little learning experience. Docker is almost like Singularity. Only thing, it, it, this image will give you everything, right? Apart from the Python stuff, that will be outside. So can you do start that and so can we'll just... Wait for 